CGS uh, fellow general officers, uh, distinguished guests. I'm uh, really honored to be here today. Uh, as you know, uh, originally General Ray Odierno, the Chief of Staff of the U.S. Army, was supposed to be here. Uh, but as some of you may know, we announced uh, our Army 2020 uh, structure uh, changes in units for inactivation on Tuesday. And I can only say that I'm very glad that I'm here in London and he is back in Washington. It is one thing to say we were going to take the United States Army from 570,000 down to 490,000. Uh, but this is the, the reality of where those 80,000 soldiers will come from. And that clearly has a significant impact uh, on where those uh, units are stationed, uh, those communities, uh, and their uh, supporting uh, areas. So he's dealing with that, and I happen to be here, and happen to be very happy to be with you. Uh, I'm going to talk uh, really about uh, strategic land power uh, from the U.S. Army's perspective. Uh, and, and what I'd like to do is begin with a little context, and Jacko has, has granted me more time, so I'll take two or three hours here, whatever it takes, <laughs> to sort of get to our perspectives. Uh, but uh, I'd like to start by sort of giving you, as I say, a little bit of context on where we are. As some of you may know, um, the, the Army has just entered into a partnership uh, with U.S. Special Operations Command and the United States Marine Corps uh, in the Office of Strategic Land Power. And some of you... Uh, well-informed uh, in this group may wonder why we are doing it at this point in time. Why is that important? What is the purpose of that? And I'm going to lay that out to you and then talk a little bit about how we're operationalizing that uh, in the force. First slide. Maybe there's something I can do. <laughs> uh, I want to talk about uh, the road to strategic land power. And I would say one of the things that's most disturbing uh, for those of us uh, in, the, in the ground forces uh, is this analysis that's currently ongoing of the lessons learned of the last 12 years of war. And that normally starts off with some sort of a statement uh, that we are, uh, the last alternative is to put boots on the ground. Our lessons from Iraq and Afghanistan were the, were the, the horror of putting ground forces in and we never want to do that again. And I would make an argument, uh, at one point in my life I actually ran the lessons learned for the United States Department of Defense for the first two years of the war. Uh, and we collected a lot of lessons learned, so I would like to take us back. That may be a lesson. If you entered this argument in 2004, 2005, but I think we have to look back beyond that to 2001 and 2002 in terms of what we were attempting to do. Uh, again, uh, net net-centric warfare, rapid decisive operations, etc., etc., fall into a category of what I describe as easy war theories. Uh, I note in your, in your packets, uh, Huba Vasasek has a great paper uh, that talks about sort of the fallacy uh, of these arguments. Um, the point I would make, and again, I would, I'm, a, I'm a part of this problem so I can talk about it. When I was a uh, lieutenant colonel uh, just finishing squadron command, I was selected by the Army to go to the Naval War College and study under a fellow by the, by the name of Admiral Sobrowski uh, to understand the, the, the detail of net-centric warfare and then serve as the G3 of the first digital division where we could then implement that in ground warfare. Uh, again, I think many of you know this theory. It talks about viewing the enemy as a complex system. It identifies critical nodes. You strike those critical nodes. It causes the systemic collapse of the adversary. Uh, leaving the adversary little choice but to surrender. Uh, and again, the idea is the power of precision strike uh, to achieve those objectives. And I, I don't want to completely, look, I am a joint guy. I believe in the power of air, land, sea, cyber, and space domains are all necessary to a successful campaign. Um, so I'm not uh, completely minimizing the importance of precision strike. No one wants the best Air Force and the best uh, Navy in the world more than I do to have on our side. But the fact of the matter is there are certain fallacies uh, in this easy war theory. So I would say um, one of the things we did in Iraq was, and believe me, I know as, a, as the head lessons learned guy, uh, that this was going to be an application of this rapid decisive operations, net centric warfare. And we executed, remember how the war started in 2003? Shock and awe. We were going to collapse the air, air defense systems, we collapsed the command and control systems, we collapsed the logistics systems, the maneuver systems. And what was supposed to happen is the enemy was then going to capitulate. 
As a matter of fact, some of us were there uh, in Kuwait and attended the capitulation rehearsal, where we were going to learn that the Iraqis were going to hand over their weapons uh, and then essentially work for us. Well, how did that work for us? Uh, I think many of us spent much of the next eight years uh, in, in theater. And I think the fundamental lesson learned here uh, is that <clears throat> we attacked Iraq essentially as ground forces uh, with too few forces and basically focused almost entirely on a targeting list and an order of battle. And to have a complex understanding of this adversary, to understand language, culture, tribal dynamics, what would be their history, what would be their reaction to this. This enemy did not capitulate because we did not see the fundamental nature of warfare, which is a clash of wills. And essentially, the enemy uh, reacted initially by abandoning its positions, etc., but then quickly remorphed and found ways to continue this struggle. So I think one of the key points here is to understand that war is an inherently human endeavor. And one of the biggest lessons learned that we can take from this, again, I think comes from our special operations brethren. One of the things that I look uh, back in my involvement uh, in Iraq and in Afghanistan uh, is really the partnership that has been formed between the special operations community and the conventional community. And if I could say, as an armored cavalry officer, the greatest thing I learned from them is the value of the human dimension and the human domain. Uh, and learning that they start this discussion by understanding people and cultures, and then develop their understanding of technologies and systems, et cetera, et cetera, where oftentimes we go uh, in the opposite direction. And really this, uh, this initiative in strategic land power stems from really our special operators saying to us uh, as, at TRADOC as we were looking at lessons learned from the war, is saying, hey, um, if we don't change the way we see the war, our, you know, our sort of the lenses, that we would call our doctrine, whether we have a human domain, whether we have seven war fighting functions, sort of the structural imperatives by which we see uh, warfare, we are likely to make the same mistakes. And what they're really afraid of is that they will go back to their own corner uh, and we will go back to our corner as we both deal with the realities of budget cuts and decreasing resources and that we will have lost uh, this lesson. So from that, uh, next slide. Uh, came the, the uh, decision to form a partnership uh, of the Office of Strategic Land Power. Uh, and, I, and I think this is very interesting uh, because uh, on the left-hand side here are really six points uh, that we make in a seven-page white paper. Uh, it, it only took uh, five months to produce this paper. So I had to get three other four-stars to sign it. And so five months, seven pages, is about right uh, in terms of how the staff worm slugs its way along. Uh, but in fact, I think these are the key points uh, in, in regard to the fundamental recognition of warfare. Now we're forming an office. We'll have our first uh, major meeting of, of the participants in, in August. And we will continue what I would think would be about a five-year effort uh, to focus our energies and thinking collaboratively uh, between the three key elements of land power to better define our arguments and better focus on the contributions of land power both in the past uh, and into the future. Uh, I think one of the points that, that I make, again, certainly is that this is fundamentally a human enterprise, a clash of wills, that there is an immutable dimension uh, to, to the human nature of conflict. Uh, again, we win wars on land, and that is a key factor, and it is about uh, the continuation of politics by other means, compelling an adversary uh, to achieve an objective. And I think this chart on the lower right-hand corner of the, uh, of the slide uh, really talks about these activities support, influence, and compel. And again, uh, much as you uh, have realized, the importance of increasing our activities in the engagement phase to support and influence, much as we've done with the Iraqi army, uh, with the Afghan army for the last uh, uh, eight and 12 years, respectively, uh, but the fact that I make about compel, and I think this is best said to me by David Morrison, the, uh, the, uh, the chief uh, of the Australian forces. Uh, one of his comments to me when I, when I was talking about this, we were talking about greater U.S. influence in the Pacific. He says, yes, we welcome your partnership uh, to come in. You know, we know the neighborhood. We'll introduce you to folks. But always remember one thing. You know, our, your ability to shape and prevent is a direct reflection of your ability to compel. 
if you don't have the competent forces, if you don't have the well-trained forces, and if you do not have the ability to win as a ground force, we are less likely uh, to certainly listen to you uh, in, in this process. Next slide. Again, the key elements of operationalizing strategic land power really are, are a number of best practices that we have generated uh, in the last uh, 12 years. Uh, I think the first one is how do we gain a sophisticated understanding of the environment we're going into? And the, and the challenge here, and I would say it took us a long time to get beyond the order of battle and the targeting list. It took us years to understand uh, adversary networks, link and node analysis, to the level that you can do manhunting for specific people. We have an entire intelligence core analysts at the battalion and brigade level who are trained to that level of analysis today, and they do not want to stop that. Anything less than investing in that in the future uh, will be a huge step backward for us. So we, we put some mechanisms in place. One is, many of you have probably heard of the Asymmetric Warfare Group. Uh, this is a tremendous organization that literally uh, went inside theater, advised units, uh, essentially watched enemy TTPs down to the detail, passed that information back, and in training at home station was able to imbue that information back while the units preparing to go to war. Why stop this when the war in Iraq and Afghanistan end? The fact is uh, we will continue to do this, and we've already placed uh, the asymmetric warfare group forward. We call them our, our, our global scouts. Uh, forward on the battlefield, gaining detailed understanding of likely hot spots that we're going to fight in. Uh, we will continue the program of placing those advisors with units that are, that are scheduled for uh, deployment rotations uh, uh, around the world. The, the second point is really the mechanism by which, uh, by which we can keep an army <coughs> engaged. And I think important that is to understand that during the Cold War years, we were a four-based army, and we knew the terrain did the terrain walks out on the old border? We knew the, we knew the culture. We knew everything, uh, essentially, because we live there. Uh, but now we're moving to an army that, in large part, is going to be based within the continental United States. There are some in the American army that say, sort of say, well, you know, you could go anywhere. So why focus on any particular place? Just fight the Krasnovians and the Bolonians and the Plywoodians, uh, our, our fake adversaries, and you'll be okay. Well, this, I'll tell you why. Because this young generation of American soldiers is used to expending its significant intellectual capital on solving real world problems, and they are not interested in going back to solving pretend problems. So what we have decided to do is align each of our units uh, with uh, one of our combatant commanders through the Army Service Component Commander uh, and begin the significant intel feeds, the significant training focus and preparation for an area of the world. Again, this will then create a pool of units and soldiers to be involved in this forward engagement process, uh, this shaping process where they can get into theater, get feet, feet on the ground, compare their academic experience with, with on the ground. Some people say, well, generally you'll never get that right. You know, it's a big world, and you can't. Let me just tell you something. If we can just get the first four brigades on the ground anywhere we go uh, to be conversant in language, our culture, networks, we will be far ahead of where we were uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan. And so we're working to that end. If there's a successful model, again, this is the Special Forces model that the United States, uh, U.S. Uh, USASOC uses. Uh, we think it will work well. But it, it is a, it's more than just a, 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 a relationship. It is, it is to say if you are a professional soldier in the United States Army, you have a responsibility for studying parts of the world you're about to deploy into, and that we can't lose those talents we have, that we developed in the last 12 years. Uh, rapidly fielding the right equipment. I know there's a lot of discussion here about the acquisition process uh, writ large uh, in the United States Army, and I see Bill Phillips squirming in his chair as I speak. Uh, um, we have had challenges on the high end uh, of our acquisition process, but one of our great successes are about 17 systems we acquired, things like the MRAPs and UAVs, et cetera, that contrib contributed directly uh, to the near-term challenge of the war fight. So the vision here is use the asymmetric war warfare group who's stationed forward around the world in all sorts of places, looking at other armies, what their challenges are, pass that information back, uh, use our NIE, in other words, uh, a battle laboratory that we run out in the desert uh, out in El Paso, and use that uh, for the purposes of developing those technologies. So when we do deploy 
the first unit to go into uh, Africa or any contingency that you could name, that in fact we have not stopped the acquisition process. We are developing tailored solutions in our acquisition process to support where they're going. Next slide. I think the biggest point that I would make here is the power that we've seen in our leaders. Let's face it, we didn't have it right when we went into Iraq and Afghanistan. But the people who adapted very quickly were the leaders on the ground at the point of attack. The key here is an investment in leader development can often mitigate your failures uh, if you don't have it right with equipment, you don't have it right in terms of the enemy you're fighting. The leader at the point of attack, if he's proper or she is properly trained uh, and is an adaptive thinking mind, can, can overcome almost anything. So there's been a, a, a significant effort. The number one priority of the Chief of Staff of the United States Army is leader development. And again, we've kind of got away from that. People might think, well, my God, you've just done 12 years of war. Uh, I mean, isn't there a lot of leader development? Yes, there is, but it's experiential leader development. And I will tell you, once we're out of Afghanistan, the reality is we're going to have to prepare leaders uh, through other means than pure experience. And we will go back to relying on uh, the institutions specifically, the classroom, education, uh, training, uh, and then other uh, experiences other than combat to prepare leaders. Will it work? Of course it worked. That's how we prepared the leaders out of contact for the war in Iraq. We've done a lot of things right, but this generation will require uh, a different set, uh, a different set of uh, leader competencies approached in a different way in terms of how the millennials, uh, in fact, learn. One of the base pieces we have talked about the Army profession. Uh, an army-wide assessment of where we stood and where we continue to stand. The survey goes out every year, but it has given us a very, we ask the soldiers the question, you know, are you a member of a profession? Well, yes, we are. About 90% of them think they are. And we say, what does that mean to you? And they list off all the classic ca characteristics of a profession uh, in terms of uh, certification competencies, trust, um, basically um, ability to perform a unique body of professional knowledge, etc. Then we turn around and ask them, how do you think we're doing? And the United States Army then did a self-critique uh, of where it stood. And it was, in fact, brutal. And it has driven us uh, to make a lot of changes, not only from their perspective, but from the perspective of the Army and its supporting systems. And again, some of those things, for instance, doctrine. Again, here we have a young generation where I would argue that doctrine perhaps failed them when they arrived in Iraq. We were debating whether that was an insurgency or not much less look at the manual. Units got used to best practice in the field, somebody else writes it down, and they probably use it on a website that's outside the United States Army. We can't have that. If we're true to be a profession, we've got to redesign the mechanisms, rewrite the fundamental doctrine, uh, get the Army refocused on doc our own doctrine. Uh, we've completed at least the first round of that, top 30 manuals the United States Army uh, rewritten, and then I would also say the method by which we deliver what we call tactics, techniques, and procedure now institutionalized on a wiki-like, probably a bad term, but a wiki-like <laughs> system uh, that uh, soldiers can access that go to each of my schools uh, and centers that are checked by. But a unit comes back from the field, they share their best practice. Another unit going can go there. And as I said, we want them going within our profession, not outside of our profession. Um, experience, uh, again, many of us think back on what really prepared us to assume positions of strategic responsibility, and again, Despite a tremendous amount of tactical time for most Army leaders, most of us look to things like attending graduate school, having done fellowships, having operated outside uh, the parameters uh, that we were comfortable with. Uh, and again, in a time of budget cutting, these are likely to be the first things that are cut. So we've made a deliberate effort at increasing the number of what we call broadening opportunities for our leaders that we believe will be strategic leaders. And again, so our fully funded graduate education program, our fully funded fellowship program, uh, and, and then re-emerging uh, into a number of competitive fellowships uh, across, uh, across the globe. Uh, education, again, much greater emphasis on that in the classroom, different learner characteristics of a very combat experienced generation. Uh, and frankly, I struggle to bring in faculty members that can match my students in regard to the amount of operational experience that lends to a different approach in the classroom, very much consistent with the uh, how to think and not what to think paradigm. And then finally, in training, this is probably the most exciting. If you really look at this, and you look at our emerging doctrine in 3.0 um, in, uh, and 6.0 and 7.0, uh, 
We're really asking this generation to say, hey, do everything you did for the last 10 years in terms of understanding language, culture, things down at the battalion level that they were doing, uh, targeting boards, etc. And oh, by the way, uh, there's a pretty good chance now that we might see uh, conflict high, in, on the higher end of the spectrum. Uh, so you need to be good at, good at combined arms maneuver as well as all the, the subsidiary competencies of uh, wide area security. Um, how are we going to do that in, in an era of diminishing resources? The good news, this generation is digitally literate. Uh, they do not have all the baggage that guys like me have who want to go out and drive tanks around and bus caps. They understand the cognitive domains of decision making and how they can get at that uh, through uh, simulations and war games. Uh, and again, still a need to go out and physically do it on the ground, but exercising these mission command skills in repetitive exercises. The good news is uh, that we're, where we are in the state of uh, technology in regard to low overhead, uh, high fidelity, uh, massive multiplayer multi online games, uh, is really uh, pretty exciting. And again, the problem I have here is whenever I talk about this, uh, the defense contractor comes to me with some massive thing that spend millions of dollars to build a, a huge structured system. What I'm really looking for is a system much like many of your children play, these online games that uh, basically they become a squad leader. Again, the vision is the soldiers sitting in their barracks room, down in the motor pool, sitting in their vehicle, with handheld devices that basically can be involved in number of these training exercises. And we're working, uh, we have an uh, integrated training network that we're, that we're putting out into our installations that we think will be the backbone um, that will, uh, in fact, enable that. Finally, mission command, and this is one of uh, the greatest danger we see for the leadership environment in our units is that as budgets constrict, as units are now garrison bound, we will see a return, heaven forbid, of what we call micromanagement. Uh, that is epidemic at times within the military, and that is the dress right, dress, line it up uh, kind of leadership that you do not see in our most effective units in Iraq, in Afghanistan, and Iraq in its heyday in Afghanistan today. Leaders uh, who are empowered by a commander's intent, who are empowered by a superior understanding of, of really the objectives of an operation, and understanding, and then given broad parameters for action and allowing subordinates to operate. I will just tell you, all the conditions are right to undo much of the goodness in terms of the leadership paradigms we've operated on and developed in our most effective units uh, for the last uh, 12 years. So again, I've talked a little bit about uh, sort of how we got to strategic land power, uh, our conceptualization of it, and then uh, essentially what are some of the, the uh, methods by which we're going to operationalize that. And I look forward to taking your questions when I sit down here. Cool.